Hello everyone, Ruxi from Creative Fecundity Incorporated is here and I am thrilled because we have a marvelous mentor, multi-accomplished John Marius here with us today. Mr. John Marius has over 30 years of experience with producing films and commercials he has traveled the globe and the United States, completing over a thousand assignments. He began, owned, and produced his own company, Brainwash, and he has worked with Academy Award-winning cinematographers and produced for directors. He has also been a career coach helping executives advance to the next level in their careers. And he is a, a mentor. He joined the Creative Problem Solving Institute and began mentoring small business owners and uh, entrepreneurs. And now he is a photographer, phenomenal photographer shooting people, places, and landscapes. John, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. My pleasure to be here. John, tell us about your business story and experience. Well, I wanted to be an actor. Actually, I wanted to be a comedian. I used to do stand-up in high school. Um, but I didn't think I could make a, any money at it. So when I went to college, I studied, you know, liberal arts and um, hated it and dropped out of school. Um, did various jobs, worked around. Uh, uh, <clears throat> I um, sold women's shoes for a while. Um, sold vacuum cleaners door to door. But um, a friend convinced me that I should go back to school. And I thought, if I'm going to go back to school, I'm going to do what I want. So I started back to school. And um, I quickly fell in love with the sort of behind the scenes part of the theater instead of the onstage part of the theater. And um, I... I made this decision, I remember earlier in the year and school didn't start until September. And so I got a job. I worked, um, I was the janitor at a small theater in LA called the Ivar Theater where they were doing a play called You're a Good Man, Charlie Brown that had run on Broadway for years. And I basically, over the next four years while I went to school, I did every job in the theater. I was a stage manager, I was an electrician. I, I, I worked in the box office. Um, there's sort of nothing I didn't do. So um, when I graduated, um, I didn't graduate, I, 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 yeah, I finished school and, uh, and the play closed um, both around the same time. And um, I decided that I didn't want to work in the theater anymore. I wanted to work in uh, motion pictures. And um, so I did something that I've advised people to do um, quite often, which is I called every person I knew. I knew. I, I picked up my phone book. I started with A and I went to Z and I called everyone I knew and asked them, if they could recommend someone for me to talk to. Um, and a friend of a friend gave me a phone number and it just so happened that she needed something picked up in San Diego the next day. Mind you, this is long before cell phones. So off I went to San Diego and I paid $50. But when I got to San Diego, they told me, call your office. I did. She said, it turns out we don't need it anymore. Just come back. But she felt bad for sending me to San Diego for nothing. So she gave me another day's work. 
And that day turned into a third day and the third day turned into a fourth. And <clears throat> I got paid by the hour. And after three weeks of putting in 60, 70 hour weeks, the people that owned the company said, well, we really like you, but we don't want to pay you this much money. I was getting paid overtime because of all these hours. Why don't we just put you on staff? And I became the staff production assistant at this company. So as it turns out, the guy that owned the company was an insomniac named Tony Bushing and was a mentor of mine. And I knew that Tony came in the office early, so I made it my business to get to work earlier than him every day. So I would commonly show up at the office at sometimes 3.30 or 4 o'clock in the morning and make really strong coffee that I knew he liked. And he would come in to the office and he would do budgets and invite me to come and sit at his desk while he smoked cigars, drank coffee and did budgets. And he showed me how to budget a job. And um, I became his producer. Um, and then I, I um, eventually, I, um, I came to uh, uh, cross purposes with one of the directors who worked there who didn't like me. And so Tony, my, my mentor, told me to go look for another job, which I did. And I got another job uh, as an executive producer at a small company that produced radio and television commercials in Alaska. And um, from there, I just started freelancing. And um, I just met people I knew, friends of friends, um, was recommended to somebody uh, who was a director from New York named Jeff Lovinger. And he, uh, he was doing a Coca-Cola commercial that literally shot around the globe. We, we, we circumnavigated the globe. And I went off on this trip with him over several months. And I sort of became his uh, um, assistant director. But his office was in New York. So I used to go to New York in the summertime and stay with friends and sleep on the floor and work, in, and, and work for Jeff all summer. And then in the winter, the New Yorkers would shoot either here in LA or in Miami. So I would do that, you know, summers in New York, winters here in Miami. And I did that for a long time until I had kids. And then um, two things happened. One is I was hired as an assistant director on a project for Kenny Rogers for CBS. And um, Kenny Rogers' manager, whose name is Ken Cragen, liked me a lot. Ken Cragen is the person who was actually the organizing force behind the song, We Are the World. Um, and so I wound up working for Cragen on staff. I produced... Kenny Rogers as the gambler, um, one of the most watched uh, uh, movies made for television of all time. And, um, and then I left there and I took a staff job with a friend um, because I had, by that time I had had my first, we had had our first child and um, I wanted to stay home more. So, um, I took a staff job as an executive producer. Um, and from there, I either worked for somebody else running their company as an executive producer or freelance as a producer or as a producer slash eight assistant director um, for any number of years. Um, 
finally, um, oh, and then I, well, I skipped a part. At, at, a, at a certain point, I, I started a little production service, uh, Marius Productions, and a guy came and worked with me named Steve Wax, and he owned a company called Chelsea Pictures. And we got along really well. And he wanted to open an L.A. office of his company. He was from Boston. And so I was a partner in Chelsea Pictures for a while, um, running the L.A. office. He, he eventually moved to New York. We were in New York, L.A. Um, and what we mostly did was produce TV commercials directed by feature film directors who we would hire one at a time. Um, so then I freelance again. And in the end, I, I wound up getting hired to work for a director named Michael Grasso um, on a job in Buenos Aires that went very well. And when, <clears throat> it's an interesting little story, when the woman who owned the company sent me a budget for the job. I said to her, you realize that you haven't put any money for airfares or per diem um, in your budget, $65,000 worth of airfares and, and, and overnight expenses had been left out of her budget. And um, she, uh, she was horrified, but we had to produce the job anyway. And she just said, you know, I'm sure you'll go over budget, but do the best you can. And I kind of made a point of bringing the job in under budget and saving her that money from the mistake that she had made. And um, we became fast friends is the point. Um, so later she that company broke up and she had started another company and I worked for her again for another one of her directors and one of our clients asked me if I could produce these little test commercials for him that were too small of a budget for regular commercial companies and I talked to her and of course she said you know yes go ahead and do that and so I did and that's what became Brainwash. Um, and I did that for, I don't know, six or seven years before I retired. I was going to retire, but I did Brainwash instead. It was just there. Brainwash was in the business of producing commercials that could be, I could get things done for a budgets that normal production companies couldn't do because of relationships that I had in the business, as long as the clients understood that they, they had to adjust their, uh, their expectations. And so I kind of, it was a, at a time in the 2000s when budgets were going down and there were lots of good jobs that didn't have any money. And I kind of, found this little niche of being able to produce things for uh, not very much money. Um, but I personally was wildly successful. Um, probably made more money in, during that time than I had uh, at any other time in my career. And um, I did that for a while uh, and then I retired. So that's my story. That it's it's such a fascinating story that you have and that you were so immersed with the media industry, with the commercials, the production, the directing, and it linked you to all all the forerunners of the publicity and uh, the commercial advertising world. It's it's truly um, a path that is uh, inspiring. I worked in um, episodic television. I produced in radio. 
I've produced uh, movies for television. I've produced variety television. Um, I produce commercials. I produced a feature film. Um, I've actually produced a documentary. It's not much in the business I haven't done at one point or another. It is a, a tremendous amount of work goes into production, the noticing of details, the synthesis of all the parts together into the whole. And so you have left a uh, an, an inspirational mark on this industry. Yet, how do you find the time uh, with the schedule you had? How did you find the time for mentorship? Because so many people out there are driven by career that they can't even fathom setting time aside for mentoring. What led you to mentoring small business owners and entrepreneurs? Well, I was retired by the time I started. That's that's one thing. So the time wasn't an issue. But I've always been a mentor in the sense that I've always helped my production assistants become production managers, my production managers become producers, and my producers become executive producers. And I, um, I've just always been interested in the way that the business works and the way that people's brains work. Um, at a certain point in my career, one thing I didn't mention is that I, I met and worked with a guy who produced television commercials for radio stations. Um, and we worked together for quite a while. Um, and he belonged to an organization called the Creative Problem Solving Institute. So I started going to their seminars. The Creative Problem Solving is a methodology of thought in which you try to have lots of ideas without um, without judging whether they're good ideas or not, um, and then um, and then assessing once you have a, a, enough ideas, then you look at them and see which ones resonate, and once you decide on the ideas that resonate, you once again think about how you can um, how you can manifest those ideas by having lots more ideas um, and then letting them resonate again. So anyway, I did that for a, a little while and that's kind of what got me interested in um, how the brain works and, and got me interested in helping people as an executive coach. Um, I will say my coaching career was never very successful because the people who needed me the most could afford me the least. Um, and so I never found a way to actually make enough money at it. Um, so when I retired, a friend of mine was involved with SCORE, um, the organization that I mentor through. He introduced me to SCORE. And that's how I started mentor. That it's it's truly an example for everyone out there what generosity is and giving back to society. It it's making the world a more healthier, better place. And that's what you have done in your career and your mentorship. If you look at society, John, our current economic system, and when you see struggling entrepreneurs as, as you yourself have gone through those moments of struggle and hardship, what are your views on the current economic system and how it can be changed to better serve entrepreneurs and small business owners. Put it out. Um, my dog's down here. Um, Welcome. <laughs> first off, um, I never struggled as an entrepreneur. Um, I've always done well at, and you know, that's just 
a bit of good fortune on my part. Secondly, I'm not sure that there's anything wrong with the economic system. There's no doubt that we have a financial imbalance, you know, uh, where too few people have too much money. You know, the something like the wealthiest half percent of Americans own more than 50% of the wealth of the country. So um, Bernie Sanders talks about it a lot. I'm a big believer in what Bernie has to say. I have a new puppy, oh, Judas. We are thrilled <laughs> to have two guests, <laughs> you and uh, your canine yes, family um, friend. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, something needs to be done about that. But that's that doesn't stop people from becoming an entrepreneur. The question about the struggle is that too many people have an idea that they think is a good idea. They look at their business from their point of view and their vision of what their business is is seen by them, from them, from their point of view, okay? So they say something to themselves like, um, I think I would be good at uh, producing TV commercials. So I'm gonna start a company that produces TV commercials and I wanna run it this way. And here's what I think about my business me, 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 I, 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 this is what I think, right? And, but they don't approach the business. Here's the other way to approach the business. I know 10 people who need to have TV commercials produced for them. So I'm going to start a company that, that answers their problem. All right. So that's the opposite way of looking at your business. That's looking at your business from the outside in instead of the inside out. And the reason that new entrepreneurs struggle, I have found, mostly is that they look at their business from in, the inside out and, and they never consider the outside in. And so I hear people all the time say, I want to produce and direct a motion picture that I wrote, but I haven't bothered to find out how pictures get produced, you know? I haven't bothered to understand how hard I have to work to get to the point where somebody will actually pay attention to my ideas. They what just say, you, I want to make a movie. What would you say? That's absolutely true. So people sometimes cannot see beyond their own perceptions. That is true. But what would you say about society outside not seeing beyond its own perception and uh, not being able to give a chance to, let's say, a small entrepreneur with that production company versus a large uh, established uh, uh, traditional I disagree with your premise. Company? Should there be a balance between a balance between both needing uh, you have outside in and inside out needing in between? No, I disagree. I I, I think that um, entrepreneurs have to sort of earn the privilege of starting their business. All right, they. And, and it's incumbent upon them to know that, to know their business inside out before they start it so that they will be a success at it. And I don't think that it is, quote unquote, society's problem or, or that, that society has any, or that the economy has any obligation to make room for new entrepreneurs or to, as you say, give them a chance. There's no giving a chance. There's taking a chance. And 
John, if you look back on your time at Brainwash, what did you wish you had known before you began your executive production of it and ventured into that adventure? I don't know. Um, I, I, I always had a, a pretty good handle on what I thought my business was going to be. Um, I, um, well, I'll tell you one thing from, from the beginning of my career, to the end, it took me a long time to understand that whether you do, if you own a business, sort of almost no matter what your business is, one of the things you must be is a good salesman. And that the way to be a good salesman is to learn how to enjoy the process of selling and learn how to enjoy um, working with people to, to get them to work with you. Um, and that there's a little game involved, you know, in terms of, you know, I'll sell you this apple for $2. Well, will you sell it to me for a dollar? No, but I'll sell it to you for a dollar and a half. You know, there's a little, that little game is involved in almost every business that we that we see the the game of making money and one of the things I, I, i'm fortunate in that i pretty much always made money in my businesses but uh a, a guy who i have a lot of respect for told me one time uh never pay for the privilege of doing the work, always make some money at it. And I tried to live by that. And um, and I found that it, it, that it was tremendously helpful. And I wish I had known it before I started. Yes, thank you. That it's very sage, practical advice. Definitely important to remember. John, before we end today, I usually have a little keepsake that I share with the audience that reminds me of the speaker. And today I have this fortune cookie saying, which has uh, the word small opportunities are often the beginning of great enterprises. Mm. And this uh, fortune cookie slogan reminds me of you because of your attention to the details. You are definitely someone who pays attention to the small, those small opportunities, those details that others often overlook. And as such, you are giving a tremendous positive contribution to society because those small, uh, everyone out there, those small entrepreneurs and small businesses, it helps them to receive that acknowledgement and to be held in equivalent standing to the larger, most visible, highly seen enterprises, organizations, companies out there. And so here, this contribution to society, it truly uh, gives you a, a commendation. Truly, it's commendable of you in all the work that you have done to elevate the small with that that is large. And thus, you are creating a more equitable world. Thank you so much for joining us, John, and for your marvelous mentorship. You have truly given hope to many out there and practical sage advice that brings them to the success that they've aspired towards. And yourself, you have achieved multi-talented success 
Congratulations.